Hey, thank you all so much for joining this community call. I am personally so excited to be presenting this. Uh, my name is Rajesh. You know, if you watch the Big Bang Theory, I'm Rajesh. <laughs> um, and I am currently a product manager in Microsoft Teams. And specifically, I am the PM for meetings extensibility. Uh, apart from uh, my, my time at Microsoft, which has been now three years, I am a proud Penn State alum. Um, and you know, uh, love to watch uh, college football. So, with, with with that introduction, I kind of want to dive into the Teams platform and how the Teams platform has evolved, um, and specifically talk about meetings extensibility. When you look at the Teams platform overall, at the very bottom, at the very foundation of the platform, there are services like Craft and SharePoint and Power Platform that then start working across different app capabilities like tabs, bots, and message extensions. And these capabilities of an app, along with the backend services that we offer, work in different surfaces within Teams. Uh, you must be familiar with personal scope, channel, and group chat. And for the first time, we are introducing meetings as a surface as well. So. Uh, this is, um, you know, a million user, billion minutes kind of an opportunity, um, and we are we we strongly encourage you to partner with us and start building some applications. So, when we think about the meetings lifecycle, uh, meetings is um, a very very interesting space in that uh, it's not just about the meeting but it starts way before the meeting even begins. So when we think about the life cycle, it's things that happen before the meeting, during the meeting, and after the meeting. And before the meeting, there are things that the users try to accomplish, specifically organizers um, who send out the meeting invitation. They would like to prepare ahead of time. And when they actually go to the meeting, they want a collaborative and productive environment. And when they actually finish the meeting, they want actionable next steps and they want something that um, something a, a place where they can store all the information and notes that they have pertaining to that particular meeting. So we've thought through the entire life cycle um, just the way uh, you, you see in, in this particular slide. And in the course of this presentation, what I'm going to talk to you about is how to actually build your application so that it fits across this, this meeting life cycle. If you go to the next slide, I'll be talking about a few things. I'll be talking about how to attach your application to the meeting life cycle before, during, and after. The second thing is I'll be talking about ways you can make your app more meeting aware, um, and I'll explain what that means in just a bit. And then finally, I'll be talking a little bit about the new UX surfaces and places where uh, your customers and your users can engage with your application. But before I even get into to the nitty gritties, uh, we already have a handful of partners who've been um, closely working with us, and PagerDuty is one of them. Uh, PagerDuty is an incident management platform that provides um, a real-time collaborative and productive environment so that customers are being served well uh, by their service provider such that when an incident comes through, a group of people can actually come together, get on a call, uh, see, make decisions, and actually have a discussion all with the context of that incident ticket that was raised. So if you see in the next few slides, like PagerDuty, the, the, the experience that they're building is before the meeting, the organizer is able to set context in the meeting chat by sending a message extension um, uh, with an adaptive card that explains what the incident is um, and bu essentially building that context. And when they actually get into the meeting, notice that there is a side panel experience where the context that the organizer created follows them. Mm -hmm. And so that everybody in the meeting can grab the context while they are in the meeting, having that discussion and making those decisions. And then finally, after the meeting, they can actually assign tasks. They can actually say that, hey, you're, you're responsible for these things, and these are the notes from the meeting itself.
So Pager Duty has intelligently gone through the entire meeting life cycle and they've used the, the new UX surfaces that we introduced and also some of the existing capabilities like message extensions to kind of complete their story. Just like Pager Duty, you all can also create some phenomenal experiences and I'm going to kind of take you through each part of the meeting life cycle and tell you how to go and build your, your application. So before the meeting, how does your app actually appear in the flyout that you see here? And particularly, you're probably wondering what does optimized for meetings even mean? I'll get to that in just a bit. But in this scenario, you're trying to add your application um, to the meeting before the meeting even starts. And how does your app actually be surfaced in this flyout? The changes that we ask you to make is uh, that the, the app manifest that you have, there are two fields. There is the, the scope field, and then there is the context field. We would want you to have group chat as the scope, and context will be meeting chat tab. And for those who are familiar with the platform already, yes, we've made changes to the app manifest. We've added a new field called context, and I highly encourage you to go read our documentation to understand more about what context actually means. The simplest way to think about it is context is mainly for where your app appears, whereas scope is for whom your app appears. Um, so just to recap, for your app to be available before the meeting, your context is meeting chat tab and your scope is group chat. That is signal for us to showcase your application in the flyout that you see here. In the next step, what happens during the meeting there is, as you see, like the in, in meeting site panel experience. And for you to actually enable your application in the meeting, as I said earlier, the context that we need is the in meeting site panel. So the context here is meeting site panel and the scope still remains group chat. That is when your app becomes meeting optimized. So if you're wondering what does optimized for meetings mean, it just means that your application functions before the meeting in the meeting chat and it functions during the meeting as well. And that's signal for us to showcase your app in the meeting optimized section of the flyer. In addition to the to the site panel, we, we are also introducing a net new surface uh, called the in-meeting dialogue. And the way you should think about the in-meeting dialogue is the ability to showcase an actionable notification in the meeting stage itself. Uh, one of the classic examples that we, we've, we've showcased here is how, how you send a poll and get users to actually participate in a poll. This is a way to get user engagement and to actually grab user attention for the most important thing. So, uh, this is something that is net new and it resembles a task module. And if you do recognize that it is in a way a task module, the underlying infrastructure is the same, but the intent and the purpose is different. So we've documented this publicly. I encourage you to read it and make sure that uh, the, the use of this surface is for the right reasons. Now, how do you actually create uh, one of these in-meeting dialogues? We, we've actually expanded our Conversations API. So if you look um, at the Conversations API, it's something that works only when you have a bot registered and when you're able to generate a bot auth token. So that's the prerequisite. And as part of the request payload, we've introduced a new field called external resource URL. And that is the, the URL that we'll be hosting inside the in-meeting dialogue. So in a way, it's a web view that contains the notification that you would like to you would like to showcase to to your customers and to and to your users. Again, I highly encourage you to read the design guidelines so that it feels native and it feels rich when when users start interacting with this. Now, the conversations API, the way it works is you'll need a, a few input parameters and. In the next few slides, I'll kind of tell you how to get those input parameters. I think so in the, in the previous slide, it's finally wrapping up the meeting lifecycle itself. So uh, what happens after the meeting? So when you actually uh, finish a meeting, users should be able to go back to the tab and, and um, 
make updates or or change things based on what they learned from the meeting as long as you've enabled your app in the pre meeting space post meeting is exactly the same surface there's no net new work that you have to do as long as you've done the work for enabling your app before the meeting with that let me get into some of the let's say like different aspects that developer should know about about the meeting itself in a, in a given meeting there is like different roles so on the left side you'll see organizer presenter and attendee these are the roles that are available in a meeting and if you see the first row on top there are different kinds of user types guest users anonymous users and in tenant users now these user types can assume any one of these roles organizer presenter and attendee but the catch is that when you want to add remove or uninstall an application in the meeting life cycle attendees cannot do it and guest users and anonymous users regardless of what role they have in the meeting cannot do it so uh, it, it's one of those very interesting things that uh, that I've marked at that the very end of of the matrix here and it also showcases the different roles um as part of the whole meeting meeting life cycle and as part of meetings extensibility we've created an api called get participant api and this api gives you the participant role so if you provide us with the participant id meeting id and tenant id we'll be able to provide you the role of that user and that's a very powerful api so that you can create experiences based on roles and when i give you a, a closing example i'll tell you how some of the developers have been thinking about it the way to now retrieve the information uh, meeting id participant id and tenant id there are a few ways to do this the first is tab sso the next is the teams client sdk and the third way to get this is through bot invoke when i say bot in work message extensions are also using bots the underlying infrastructure so it applies to both message extensions and bots you can get uh, the participant id and tenant id through any one of these methods but we highly recommend you to use tab sso and as far as meeting id is concerned you can either use the client side sdk or you can use the bot in work and below are the links uh, we'll also share this out with you to kind of help you get, get up to speed on on these concepts in addition to the get participant api on the next slide uh, the, the the last line will be something called as frame contact earlier i said that your app can be aware of the meeting itself what frame contact does is that it gives you knowledge on where the user is and from where they have invoked your app invoking an app from the in meeting window versus invoking the app from say pre meeting or post meeting is different and your experience or the content that you want to generate could change based on where the user is frame context is that is is that tool for you to determine where the user has invoked your app from so that you can render appropriate experiences so with that uh, there's always the the more admin oriented aspect so in the next few slides i'll kind of quickly gloss over uh, the different admin experiences so that you are aware of how your app is being treated admins and organizer controls for the very first time anonymous users are able to not just join a call but they can also interact with apps and like i said earlier they cannot add remove or uninstall applications but if you send an adaptive card to the meeting chat they can actually participate in it anonymous users but if admins are not happy about it they can actually use the new control that we've provided which is the ability to um turn off anonymous users from interacting with applications if you go to admin.teams.microsoft.com into meeting settings you will see a toggle that says uh, anon allow anonymous users to interact with applications it's default on um but we we like i said you know we've given uh, admins the ability to go and turn it off if uh, they don't want this to happen in addition to this uh, you must all already be familiar with permission policies it's 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 a feature that we announced last year 
where admins can actually selectively go and enable or disable applications for users and for the tenant itself. And with introducing meeting applications or meetings extensibility, we'll continue to honor any permission policy. So let's say that your organization or your customer has blocked or has enabled a handful of apps. And let's say that your app now has meetings extensibility. Nothing changes in terms of their policy. If if it's blocked, it remains blocked. If it's allowed, it will be it'll continue to be allowed. In addition to this, I think a few things are um, like I said earlier, an organizer or a presenter are the only ones who can add or remove applications or install applications or uninstall applications. So in the meeting window, uh, when, when, when you right click, only organizers and presenters will be able to perform these, these operations and not attendees or not anonymous users or guest users. I think that kind of brings me to, to the end of this presentation. And I'll kind of wrap it up with uh, with one example, which is Polly. So the way Polly has done this whole thing is before and after the meeting experience, they have added meeting chat tab to their manifest as a context. Now, because of that, they are able to operate as a tab in the meeting chat uh, before and after the meeting. When you go to during the meeting, they've enabled meeting site panel as the manifest context, which is why they are able to render the in-meeting site panel. And if you notice, uh, there is a button called create, create a poll. Uh, they've used the get participant API to determine whether the participant is a presenter or organizer or attendee, and they are rendering experiences in that site panel according to the role of, of the user who's using the application. And then during the meeting, they are also they have also integrated with the in-meeting in meeting dialogue. To my earlier point, they've used the conversations API and they've given us an external external resource URL to help us render render this experience um, during the meeting so that users can create polls and get responses from all meeting participants. And then even, even in here, you'll notice the fact that they've used the participant role API to see like who gets to see the results versus attendees who probably shouldn't be seeing the results just yet. Yet They should just be participating in the poll, but then it depends on uh, the role so that they can determine whether they show the results or not on, on the site panel. I think, yeah, so with, with that, you know, that's Polly's experience, the way they've wrapped things together. And some of the resources um, are, are here for you to get started and build similar experiences or even, even better experiences through your customer needs and also through your creativity. Thank you. Awesome. No, thank you, Rajesh, for you know taking time to to walk us through all of this. This is a super exciting area, and we're looking forward to all of the amazing you know meeting apps that are going to be created using these. So you know, to all the to the devs on this call, you know, start playing around with this. See, you know, we definitely want to see all of the, you know, the awesome apps that you can create with this. Mm -hmm.